Well, good morning, our Savior. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Welcome to worship this morning. If you are here in the sanctuary or you're joining us online via YouTube or Facebook, we want to welcome you to worship. It is always a wonderful time to come together and serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I have to say, the weather is absolutely beautiful outside. How many think that we should have a worship service outside sometime? Yeah, very good. How many think that should be like August 15? <laughs> All right, I'm hearing a big no on that one. Hey, go ahead in just a moment here. Take a, take a look around you. Say hello to somebody next to you this morning and greet them in the name of the Lord. Hey, good morning. All right, let's go ahead and stand this morning. As together we begin our time in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sometimes choosing just to sing is a thing that changes everything. Hallelujah, when the storm is real.
You called me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fade. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stay.
oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. I am yours. You are mine. Heavenly Father, just praise and thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, as we bask in the warmth of your victory on Easter Sunday. We praise and thank you for all that you do for us and for our salvation, that we are not overwhelmed by the waves in life, that we can always know that you are our everlasting God, and no matter what befalls us, you are there with us and for us. We pray this today, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah, you're right. You get the old guy today. (laughs) Again, good morning. Live, love, nation. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Yeah, we can still say that. We can still say that because Easter is not just a day. It is a season. And for us as Christians, it is to be our lifestyle. Amen? I heard this story about a pastor who invited all the children to come down front for a children's message, and before the pastor could even get started, a little boy asked him, Pastor, what's the first thing that Jesus said when he came out of the tomb? Now, here was a question that had deep theological importance, and the pastor had to try to explain in words that his young audience could understand that the Bible doesn't really tell us What's the first thing Jesus said when he came out of the tomb? But one little girl, she was waving her hand. I know, I know, Pastor, I know. So Pastor, okay, Sally, what's the first thing that Jesus said when he came out of the tomb? And little Sally stood up, pushed her dress down, and then she goes, (laughs) ta-da! Now, as many of you know, I retired from full-time ministry in 2018. And so that whole last year before my retirement was my year of last ones, my last confirmation class, my last Thanksgiving, my last Christmas, and of course my last Easter. But two months after I retired, God saw fit to continue to use me in ministry, and over the past five years, I actually ended up filling three different pastoral vacancies, and I still got to do all those special services that I enjoyed doing during those years of ministry. And I love Easter. I absolutely love Easter. Last year, in fact, was the first time since 1985 that I didn't get the opportunity to preach on Easter. But I'm here this morning with you as the Easter story continues. And the, the heart of the Easter message is Christ is risen. He is alive. The heart of the Christian message is the best good news the world has ever received. And it has great meaning for us in our eternal life. There was this uh, Sunday school teacher who was discussing this with her class of second graders, and she asked the class now, she said, if I were to sell my house and give all that money to the church, would that get me into heaven? And in unison, the whole class goes, no. Well, then the teacher said, well, what if I were to be really kind to animals and really love my husband and my children? Would that get me into heaven? And again, the kids go, no. Well, then she said, well, how about if I volunteer all my time and do all the work around the church for free? Would that get me into heaven? No, the children said. Well, then how do I get into heaven, she asked. And a little boy blurted out, you got to be dead. Now, that wasn't quite the answer that the teacher was looking for, 
But there is some truth to it. St. Paul said that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is, in, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I think it was Ben Franklin who said there are two things in life that we can be certain of, and it's death and taxes. But of course, we don't need Ben Franklin to remind us of that. We all know from our own human experience, the reality of death is all around us. But Easter, Easter is about living. St. Paul said, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I've always loved the story of the three men who are going to be recognized for their civic achievements in their community. But before the award presentation, they were asked, they said, the mayor told them, now you all have distinguished yourselves in our community. And now, before we present your awards, what would you like to hear people say about you at your funeral years from now? And so the first guy got up and he said, well, at my funeral, I'd like to hear people say that I was a successful businessman. I was a leader in this community. And I supported all our local charities. Everyone applauded and he sat down. The second guy got up and he said, well, at my funeral, I'd like to hear people say that I was a faithful and loving husband to my wife. I was an active father in my children's lives, a helping neighbor to our friends and our neighbors. Everyone applauded and he sat down. The next guy got up and he said, well, at my funeral, at my funeral, I'd like to hear people say, look, he's moving. <laughs> Last Sunday, we had just a terrific Easter celebration here at Our Savior. How many were here last Sunday? Hey, amen. It was great. You know, Christ's resurrection from the dead is the cornerstone of our Christian faith. Look what... Uh, St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ indeed has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ indeed has been raised from the dead. And Christ's victory over death in the grave is very significant because his victory is over sin and death and hell and Satan. And his victory is our victory. Did you know that all but four of the world's religions are based upon mere philosophical propositions? And of the four world religions that are based upon personalities, only Christianity claims the empty tomb for its founder. Consider this. 1,900 years before Christ, Abraham, the father of Judaism, died and was buried in Canaan. 483 years before Christ, Buddhist historical writings indicate that Buddha died, he was cremated, and his remains are buried in Sri Lanka. On June 8th, 632 years after Jesus, Islam's Muhammad died, and his tomb is in Saudi Arabia. In 33 AD, Jesus Christ of Nazareth was crucified, died, and was buried. But he conquered death and the grave. He came back to life victoriously. He, Jesus told his disciples, because I live, you too shall live. And he showed himself visibly and physically alive many times to numerous people. If you remember from last week, Pastor Chris emphasized this, that Jesus' first appearance on Easter Sunday was to Mary Magdalene. She went to the empty tomb. She was distraught. She was crying. And as she was sitting there outside the empty tomb, it wasn't until Jesus called her by name, he said, Mary. And Mary turned around and she saw Jesus and she said, Rabboni. Jesus also appeared to the other women that had gone out to the tomb to anoint his body. Mary, the, the mother of James and Salome and Joanna. 
When they heard the angel say, he is risen, he is not here, they went to tell Jesus' disciples. But on the way, Jesus also appeared to them. Another appearance was to Peter. In fact, Peter is the first person mentioned in St. Paul's list of witnesses. And he was the first of the apostles to see our risen Lord. Luke, in his gospel account, writes, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. This, I think, was a a private appearance uh, to Peter to reassure Peter since he had so vehemently denied even knowing Jesus three days before on Monday, Thursday. Later on that first Easter Sunday, Jesus appeared to two of his disciples who were making their way to Emmaus. And then Easter evening, the last of the five Easter Sunday appearances, was to all of his disciples who were meeting behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. But Thomas was not with them. We read in John's Gospel, for example, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hand, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Is it any wonder he got the moniker of being doubting Thomas? Jesus also appeared to seven of his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. He also appeared to all of his disciples on a mountain in Galilee, which is where he gave them the great commission to go and make disciples of all people. And St. Paul records for us, St. Paul records for us that Jesus also appeared to over 500 people at one time, and the scriptures tell us that Jesus appeared to James, then to all the apostles, as well as to Saul of Tarsus, as he was making his way to Damascus. But there is one other particular appearance of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that I'd like to focus on this morning. A week after Easter, Jesus again appeared to his disciples, who again were meeting behind closed doors, and this time Thomas was with them. Thomas had his doubts, because the story that Jesus was alive was just too good to be true. He could not believe it. He wanted proof. He wanted to physically see Jesus for himself. Remember, he said, unless I see the nail prints in his hand and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. He expected so much from Jesus, but then to see him brutally crucify and die on the cross, well, it was just too much. It was just too much for Thomas. He just couldn't believe without seeing Jesus for himself. And so what about us? What about us? I think if we're really honest with ourselves, we may have to admit that we too, in the course of our life, have maybe had our doubts or misgivings, misunderstandings about God and his and our relationship with him. I did. I was only 17 years old. It was in the spring of my senior year in high school, 1967. My mom and dad and I, we went down to Concordia College in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for an official visit, you know, to see the campus, look at the library, attend some classes, eat in the cafeteria, because I was going to go to school there in the fall to begin studying for the ministry. I had wanted to be a pastor since I was about 10 years old. And I was so looking forward to starting my studies. In high school, I even took all the courses that were necessary to begin the pre-ministry program, which included two years of Latin and two years of German. But that day at Concordia College in Milwaukee was disastrous. Instead of visiting classes and looking at the campus and eating in the cafeteria, 
we were told to go and have a meeting with the college president, Dr. Walter Stunkel. I sat across his desk and he said, Dan, you only got average grades in German, lower grades in Latin, and when you come down here, not only do you have to continue with the Latin and the German, but you also have to start learning the Greek and the Hebrew. The bottom line is we don't think you have the aptitude for the languages, and we don't think you're pastoral material, and we're not going to admit you. Well, I was crushed. I mean, I was completely devastated. And I wondered how and why was God doing this to me when I so wanted to serve him for the rest of my life. I felt so rejected by God. Long story short, about 18 months later, I ended up enlisting in the United States Coast Guard. Following basic training, my first duty station was aboard ship out of San Juan, Puerto Rico. But 18 months after that, I got stationed at Fort Myers Beach, Florida at the Coast Guard Station. And that was great. I still had not been worshiping. I think I still had a, a spiritual chip on my shoulder, so to speak. You see this guy? A couple of good looking guys, huh? That's a picture of Scott Richardson and myself. We uh, reconnected a couple of weeks ago. He and his wife were down in Venice, Florida, so we had lunch together at uh, a restaurant down in uh, Sarasota. Scott and I were stationed together in 1970 at that Coast Guard station at Fort Myers Beach. Scott was actually there before I got there, so he was all settled in and well-established. But I'm mentioning that because, you see, God used Scott in a very powerful way in my life when I was dealing with my doubts and my questioning with God. It was one day, 54 years ago, about this time of the year, Scott casually came up to me one day at the Coast Guard station and he said, Hey, Dan, are you a Christian? I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. He said, oh, what denomination do you belong to? I said, well, I was Lutheran. He said, hey, so am I. What kind of Lutheran are you? <laughs> I said, I'm Missouri Synod. He said, wow, so am I. He said, my wife and I, we belong to St. Michael Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, it's the closest LCMS church to the Coast Guard station, but it's about 25 miles away. But I say, we're going to go to church this week. How about we come around and pick you up, and we'll take you to church with us? I said, no, I don't think so. The following week, Scott came around to me again, and he said, say, Dan, my wife and I are going to church this week. We'd be happy to come by and pick you up, take you to church with us. We'd love to take you. I said, no, I don't think so. So in my mind, I'm thinking, now I, I rejected his offer two times. Now he'll stop asking. Oh, no. <laughs> no, Scott continued to persevere. And the next time that he and his wife were going to church, it wasn't right away the next week, but the next time they were going to church again, he again, he came up to me and he said, my wife and I are going to church on Sunday. We'd love to come by and pick you up and take you to church with us. Now I'm thinking, you know what? This guy is not going to give up. I might as well say yes and just get it over with. And so I did. I said, yes, I'll go to church with you on Sunday. On Sunday they came, they picked me up, they took me to, to St. Michael's Lutheran Church in Fort Myers. I was so warmly received by the other members in that congregation. It was the most wonderful experience. I just, I can't explain it all. It was so wonderful to be back in worship with my brothers and sisters in Christ, to hear God's word being preached and to have communion, to uh, unburden myself with through confession and absolution. The fellowship was just unbelievable. 
And I had been a Missouri Synod Lutheran my entire life, baptized and confirmed. I graduated from parochial school. I was in church every Sunday. I was in Sunday school or Bible class every week. Very active in the Walther League. But I think I had suppressed all of that because I was still feeling rejected. I did not understand God's plan in my life. The very next day, Pastor Hoyer came out to the Coast Guard station to visit with me because I was a visitor at his church the day before. (laughs) And he spent about an hour with me and getting to know each other a little bit better. And he ended that conversation by saying, now next Sunday when you come to church, my wife and I want to have you over to the house for Sunday dinner. Well, the rest is history. I soon joined St. Michael's Lutheran Church, became very active in that congregation. At one time, I was even serving on the church council for youth and young adults. 1972, though, I finished my tour of duty down at Fort Myers, and I went back to Wisconsin. I went back to college. I earned my degree. I had a very successful and promising career, a secular career, beautiful family. And I still felt that God was calling me into the ministry. I tried to ignore those feelings. But no matter how involved I got in the life of my church, it was never enough. It was never enough. I still felt that God wanted me to be in the pastoral ministry. And in 1981, in the spring of 1981, I resigned my secular career. And in the fall of 1981, I began studying for the ministry at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. And it started with Greek. But I did get A's. (laughs) I was ordained in 1985, 15 years after Scott invited me to come back to church. You know, like Thomas, I think people have always struggled with their doubts. And like me, maybe you too have had that experience at one time or another in your own personal life. But one of the things that I discovered is that during those times, those periods in my life where I was having doubts or questioning God's direction in my life, God led me to even greater faith. And he leads all of us to greater faith as he draws us closer to himself. I also learned that God's timing in life is perfect. I know now, looking back, I wasn't near ready to begin studying for the ministry in 1967. But God knew And even though I felt rejected, I wasn't. God's precious promises continued to ring true. Promises like, I will never leave you or forsake you. Let's finish up with Thomas. Let's read this together. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Here Jesus was telling his disciples that there is a better way of coming to faith, and it's by hearing and believing. In essence, Jesus was saying that from now on, faith would no longer be transmitted by personal visits from our Savior, but by the power of the Holy Spirit working through the gospel as it is shared with one another. Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen me, yet have believed. Friends, you and I are here today worshiping our risen Lord and Savior because the generations of people before us were transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and have passed that faith down to us. St. Paul said it this way, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word, and that word is centered in Christ. Yes, eating cheddar biscuits is really great, (laughs) and watching a Hallmark movie channel once is enough. But friends, people will come to faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior as they hear the message of salvation. 
St. Paul wrote to the Romans that the righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Last week, Pastor Chris, he highlighted John 3, 16. We're all familiar with that verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I think John 3, 17 is equally powerful. There Jesus says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Friends, Jesus truly loves and cares for each and every one of us. If you have ever doubted God's love for you, if you have ever doubted his ability to forgive you no matter what you've done or where you've been, we've got the strong testimony of Scripture. We have his precious promises. But above all, we have his Easter victory. Easter was God's acceptance of everything that Jesus Christ has done for us and for our salvation, gaining for us the forgiveness of sins and that promise of eternal life. Forgiveness so great that even those times of doubting and questioning are forgiven. St. Paul said, There is nothing in all creation that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so our post-Easter challenge is really twofold. First of all, I pray that we all would continue to hear God's word, to grow in our own faith and in our relationship with our Savior. And then secondly, I pray that we would be like Scott, to be bold and willing to share our faith and to invite other people to come and hear the good news that Jesus died and rose again for all people. It's living love. The Bible says that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And yes, we all may have times in our life that we go through some struggles. We may have some doubts. We may have some questions. But let's remember what St. Paul also said. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. For it's with our mouth that we believe and are justified, and it is with our mouth that we profess and are saved. In closing, let me just share this poem with you that, has, that meant so much to me as I was going through my periods of doubt. It's entitled Footprints in the Sand. One night I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Many scenes from my life flashed across the sky. In each scene of my life, I noticed footprints in the sand. Sometimes there were two sets of footprints, and other times there was only one. And I noticed that at the lowest and saddest times of my life, I could only see one set of footprints. And so I said, Lord, you promised me that you would walk with me always. Why, when I needed you the most, would you leave me? And the Lord replied, my precious, precious child, I love you. I would never leave you. When you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. To him be all the honor, glory, and praise. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just want to praise and thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. And in the wake, in the wake of celebrating his victory over death in the grave on Easter, oh, what joy fills our hearts. This morning, Lord, we especially pray that whenever we have moments in life, maybe doubting your love or questioning your forgiveness, we pray that you would strengthen our faith walk in you for the sake of Jesus our Lord and Savior. Lord, we need you every moment of our life. Help us not to lose faith, faith when, seem, when things seem to go wrong, but to trust your plans and your timing for us. You know, sometimes our circumstances can be challenging, but we know there are, there are many things to be grateful for. And no matter what, we know that you are always with us. So through your word, Lord, continue to guide us. We thank you for always caring and loving us. Most importantly, we thank you for your forgiveness of all of our sins, all our shortcomings in life. 
We pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We want to thank you all for supporting financially our our ministry and our missions here at Our Savior. If you would like to contribute to those, we have a bowl in the back of the church that you can place your your contributions, but we're also on OurSavior.fl, and you can text. uh, There's the number. We're also on on Venmo. So we thank you for supporting uh, the Lord's work here at Our Savior. May God richly bless your week. Let's stand and praise the Lord. against us now.